Book 16. So they fought on both sides for the sake of the strong benched vessel. Meanwhile Patroclus came to the shepherd of the people, Achilles, and stood by him and wept warm tears, like a spring dark running that down the face of a rock impassable drips its dim water, and swift-footed brilliant Achilles looked on him in pity, and spoke to him aloud and addressed him in winged words, Why then are you crying like some poor little girl, Patroclus, who runs after her mother and begs to be picked up and carried, and clings to her dress, and holds her back when she tries to hurry, and gazes tearfully into her face, until she is picked up? You are like such a one, Patroclus, dropping these soft tears. Could you have some news to tell, for me or the Myrmidons? Have you, and nobody else, received some message from fire? Yet they tell me Actor's son Menoetios lives still and Iaco's son Peleus lives still among the Myrmidons. If either of these died we should take it hard. Or is it the Argives you are mourning over, and how they are dying against the hollow ships by reason of their own arrogance? Tell me, do not hide it in your mind, and so we shall both know. Then groaning heavily, Patroclus the rider, you answered, son of Peleus, far greatest of the Achaeans, Achilles, do not be angry, such grief has fallen upon the Achaeans. For all those who were before the bravest in battle are lying up among the ships with arrow or spear wounds. The son of Tydeus, strong Diams, was hit by an arrow, and Odysseus has a pike wound, and Agamemnon the spear famed, and Eurypylos has been wounded in the thigh with an arrow. And over these the healer skilled in medicine are working to cure their wounds. But you, Achilles, who can do anything with you? May no such anger take me as this that you cherish. Cursed courage. What other man born hereafter shall be advantaged unless you beat aside from the Argives this shameful destruction? Pitilis, the rider Peleus was never your father nor the Tees was your mother, but it was the grey sea that bore you and the towering rocks, so sheer the heart in you is turned from us. But if you are drawing back from some prophecy known in your own heart and by Zeus will your honoured mother has told you of something, then send me out at least, let the rest of the Myrmidon people follow me, and I may be a light given to the Danans. Give me your armour to wear on my shoulders into the fighting, so perhaps the Trojans might think I am you, and give way from their attack, and the fighting sons of the Achaeans get wind again after hard work. There is little breathing space in the fighting. We unwearied might with a mere cry pile men wearied back upon their city, and away from the ships and the shelters. So he spoke supplicating in his great innocence, this was his own death and evil destruction he was entreating. But now, deeply troubled, swift-footed Achilles answered him, Ah, Patroclus, illustrious, what is this you are saying? I have not any prophecy in mind that I know of, there is no word from Zeus my honoured mother has told me, but this thought comes as a bitter sorrow to my heart and my spirit when a man tries to foul one who is his equal, to take back a prize of honour, because he goes in greater authority. This is a bitter thought to me, my desire has been dealt with roughly. The girl the sons of the Achaeans chose out for my honour, and I won her with my own spear, and stormed a strong fenced city, is taken back out of my hands by powerful Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, as if I were some dishonoured vagabond. Still, we will let all this be a thing of the past, and it was not in my heart to be angry forever, and yet I have said I would not give over my anger until that time came when the fighting with all its clamour came up to my own ships. So do you draw my glorious armour about your shoulders, lead the Myrmidons whose delight is battle into the fighting, if truly the black cloud of the Trojans has taken position strongly about our ships, and the others, the Argives, are bent back against the beach of the sea, holding only a narrow division of land, and the whole city of the Trojans has descended upon them boldly, because they do not see the face of my helmet glaring close, or else they would run and cram full of dead men the watercourses, if powerful Agamemnon treated me kindly. Now the Argives fight for their very encampment. For the spear rages not now in the hands of the son of Tydeus, Diams, to beat destruction aside from the Danans, nor have I heard the voice of the son of Atreus crying from his hated head, no, but the voice of murderous Hector calling to the Trojans crashes about my ears, with their war cry they hold the entire plain as they beat the Achaeans in battle. But even so, Patroclus, beat the bane aside from our ships, fall upon them with all your strength, let them not with fires blazing inflame our ships, and take away our desired homecoming. But obey to the end this word I put upon your attention so that you can win, for me, great honour and glory in the sight of all the Danans, so they will bring back to me the lovely girl, and give me shining gifts in addition. When you have driven them from the ships, come back, although later the thunderous lord of Hera might grant you the winning of glory, you must not set your mind on fighting the Trojans, whose delight is in battle, without me. 
so you will diminish my honor. You must not, in the pride and fury of fighting, go on slaughtering the Trojans, and lead the way against Ilion, for fear some one of the everlasting gods on Olympos might crush you. Apollo who works from afar loves these people dearly. You must turn back once you bring the light of salvation to the ships, and let the others go on fighting in the flat land. Father Zeus, Athene and Apollo, if only not one of all the Trojans could escape destruction, not one of the Argives, but you and I could emerge from the slaughter so that we two alone could break Troy's hallowed coronal. Now as these two were talking thus to each other, meanwhile the volleys were too much for Aeus, who could hold no longer his place. The will of Zeus beat him back, and the proud Trojans with their spears, and around his temples the shining helmet clashed horribly under the shower of strokes, he was hit constantly on the strong wrought cheek pieces, and his left shoulder was tiring from always holding up the big glittering shield, yet they could not beat him out of his place, though they piled their missiles upon him. His breath came ever hard and painful, the sweat ran pouring down his body from every limb, he could find no means to catch his breath, but evil was piled on evil about him. Tell me now, you muses who have your homes on Olympos, how fire was first thrown upon the ships of the Achaeans. Hector stood up close to Aeus and hacked at the ash spear with his great sword, striking behind the socket of the spearhead, and slashed it clean away, so that Telamonian and Aeus shook there in his hand a lopped spear, while far away from him the bronze spearhead fell echoing to the ground, and Aeus knew in his blameless heart, and shivered for knowing it, how this was God's work, how Zeus high thundering cut across the intention in all his battle, how he planned that the Trojans should conquer. He drew away out of the missiles, and the Trojans threw weariless fire on the fast ship, and suddenly the quenchless flame streamed over it. So the fire was at work on the ship's stern, but Achilles struck his hands against both his thighs, and called to Patroclos, rise up, illustrious Patroclos, rider of horses. I see how the ravening fire goes roaring over our vessels. They must not get our ships so we cannot run away in them. Get on your armor, faster, I will muster our people. He spoke, and Patroclos was helming himself in bronze that glittered. First he placed along his legs the beautiful greaves, linked with silver fastenings to hold the greaves at the ankles. Afterward he girt on about his chest the corslet starry and elaborate of swift-footed Iacides. Across his shoulders he slung the sword with the nails of silver, a bronze sword, and above it the great shield, huge and heavy. Over his mighty head he set the well-fashioned helmet with the horsehair crest, and the plumes nodded terribly above it. He took up two powerful spears that fitted his hand's grip, only he did not take the spear of blameless Iacides, huge, heavy, thick, which no one else of all the Achaeans could handle, but Achilles alone knew how to wield it, the Pelian ash spear which Chaion had brought to his father from high on Pelion to be death for fighters. Patroclos ordered Automedon rapidly to harness the horses, a man he honored most, after Achilles breaker of battles, who stood most staunchly by him against the fury of fighting. For him Automedon led the fast-running horses under the yoke, Xanthos and Balios, who tore with the wind speed, horses stormy podage once conceived of the west wind and bore, as she grazed in the meadow beside the swirl of the ocean. In the traces beside these he put unfaulted Pedasos whom Achilles brought back once when he stormed Aetian city. He, mortal as he was, ran beside the immortal horses. But Achilles went meanwhile to the Myrmidons, and arrayed them all in their war gear along the shelters. And they, as wolves who tear flesh roar, in whose hearts the battle fury is tireless, who have brought down a great horned stag in the mountains, and then feed on him, till the jowls of every wolf run blood, and then go all in a pack to drink from a spring of dark running water, lapping with their lean tongues along the black edge of the surface and belching up the clotted blood, in the heart of each one is a spirit and tremulous, but their bellies are full and groaning, as such the lords of the Myrmidons and their men of counsel around the brave henchmen of swift-footed Iacide swarmed, and among them was standing warlike Achilles and urged on the fighting men with their shields, and the horses. Fifty were the fast-running ships wherein Achilles beloved of Zeus had led his men to Troy, and in each one were fifty men, his companions in arms, at the rowing benches. He had made five leaders among them, and to these entrusted the command, while he in his great power was lord over all of them. One battalion was led by Menestheos of the Shining Corslet, son of Spacheos, the river swelled from the bright sky, born of the daughter of Peleus, Polydor the lovely, to unremitting Spacheos, when a woman lay with an immortal, but born in name to Perier's son, Boros, who married Polydor formerly, and gave gifts beyond count to win her. 
the next battalion was led by warlike Eudoros, a maiden's child, born to one lovely in the dance, Polymel, daughter of Phylas, whom strong Hermes Argifonts loved, when he watched her with his eyes among the girls dancing in the choir for clamorous Artemis of the Golden Distaff. Presently Hermes the healer went up with her into her chamber and lay secretly with her, and she bore him a son, the shining Eudoros, a surpassing runner and a quick man in battle. But after Ilethia of the hard pains had brought out the child into the light, and he looked on the sun shining, Actor's son Echicles in the majesty of his great power led her to his house, when he had given numberless gifts to win her, and the old man Phylas took the child and brought him up kindly and cared for him, in affection as if he had been his own son. The leader of the third battalion was warlike Paisandros, my Marlo's son, who outshone all the rest of the Myrmidons in spear fighting, next to Pele and Achilles' henchmen. The fourth battalion was led by Phoenix, the aged horseman, the fifth by Alchimedon, the blameless son of Lex. But after Achilles gave them their stations all in good order beside their leaders, he laid his stern injunction upon them. Myrmidons, not one of you can forget those mutterings, those threats that beside the running ships you made at the Trojans in all the time of my anger, and it was I you were blaming, as, hard son of Peleus. Your mother nursed you on Gaul. You have no pity, to keep your companions here by the ships unwilling. We should go back home again, then, in our seafaring vessels now that this wretched anger has befallen your spirit. Often you would gather in groups and so mutter against me, and now is shown a great work of that fighting you longed for. Then let each man take heart of strength to fight with the Trojans. So he spoke, and stirred the spirit and strength in each man, and their ranks, as they listened to the king, pulled closer together. And as a man builds solid a wall with stones set close together for the rampart of a high house keeping out the force of the winds, so close together were the helms and shields massive in the middle. For shield leaned on shield, helmet on helmet, man against man, and the horsehair crests along the horns of the shining helmets touched as they bent their heads, so dense were they formed on each other. And before them all were two men in their armor, Patroclos and Automedon, both of them in one single fury to fight in front of the Myrmidons. But meanwhile Achilles went off into his shelter, and lifted the lid from a lovely elaborately wrought chest, which the tees the silver-footed had put in his ship to carry, and filled it fairly with tunics and mantles to hold the wind from a man, and with fleecy blankets. Inside this lay a wrought goblet, nor did any other man drink the shining wine from it nor did Achilles pour from it to any other god, but only Zeus' father. He took this now out of the chest, and cleaned it with sulphur first, and afterward washed it out in bright running water, and washed his own hands, and poured shining wine into the goblet and stood in his middle forecourt and prayed, and poured the wine, looking into the sky, not unseen by Zeus who delights in the thunder, High Zeus, Lord of Dodona, Pelasgian, living afar off, brooding over wintry Dodona, your prophets about you living, the Seloi who sleep on the ground with feet unwashed. Hear me. As one time before when I prayed to you, you listened and did me honour, and smote strongly the host of the Achaeans, so one more time bring to pass the wish that I pray for. For see, I myself am staying where the ships are assembled, but I send out my companion and many myrmidons with him to fight. Let glory, Zeus of the wide brows, go forth with him. Make brave the heart inside his breast, so that even Hector will find out whether our henchman knows how to fight his battles by himself, or whether his hands rage invincible only those times when I myself go into the grind of the war god. But when he has beaten back from the ships their clamorous onset, then let him come back to me and the running ships, unwounded, with all his armor and with the companions who fight close beside him. So he spoke in prayer, and Zeus of the councils heard him. The father granted him one prayer, and denied him the other. That Patroclos should beat back the fighting assault on the vessels he allowed, but refused to let him come back safe out of the fighting. When Achilles had poured the wine and prayed to Zeus' father he went back into the shelter, stowed the cup in the chest, and came out to stand in front of the door, with the desire in his heart still to watch the grim encounter of Achaeans and Trojans. Now they who were armed in the company of great-hearted Patroclos went onward, until in high confidence they charged on the Trojans. The Myrmidons came streaming out like wasps at the wayside when little boys have got into the habit of making them angry by always teasing them as they live in their house by the roadside, silly boys, they do something that hurts many people, and if some man who travels on the road happens to pass them and stirs them unintentionally, they in heart of fury come swarming out each one from his place to fight for their children. 
In heart and in fury like these the Myrmidon streaming came out from their ships, with a tireless clamour arising, and Patroclos called afar in a great voice to his companions, Myrmidons, companions of Peleus' son, Achilles, be men now, dear friends, remember your furious valour, we must bring honour to Peleus' son, far the greatest of the Argives by the ships, we, even the henchmen who fight beside him. So Atreus' son wide ruling Agamemnon may recognise his madness, that he did no honour to the best of the Achaeans. So he spoke, and stirred the spirit and strength in each man. They fell upon the Trojans in a pack, and about them the ships echoed terribly to the roaring Achaeans. But the Trojans, when they saw the powerful son of Menoetios himself and his henchmen with him in the glare of their war gear, the heart was stirred in all of them, the battalions were shaken in the expectation that by the ship's swift-footed Peleion had thrown away his anger and chosen the way of friendship. Then each man looked about him for a way to escape the sheer death. Patroclos was the first man to make a cast with the shining spear, straight through the middle fighting, where most men were stricken, beside the stern on the ship of great-hearted Protosilaus, and struck Pyrachmes, who had led the lords of Paeonian horses from Amidon and the wide waters of Axios. He struck him in the right shoulder, so he dropped in the dust groaning, on his back, and his Paeonian companions about him scattered, for Patroclos drove the fear into all of them when he cut down their leader, the best of them all in battle. He drove them from the ships and put out the fire that was blazing, and that ship was left half burnt as it was, as the Trojans scattered in terror and unearthly noise, and the Danan streamed back along the hollow ships, and clamour incessant rose up. And as when from the towering height of a great mountain Zeus who gathers the thunder flash stirs the cloud dense upon it, and all the high places of the hills are clear and the shoulders outjutting and the deep ravines, as endless bright air spills from the heavens, so when the Danans had beaten from their ships the ravening fire, they got breath for a little, but there was no check in the fighting, for the Trojans under the attack of the warlike Achaeans had not yet turned their faces to run. Away from the black ships. They stood yet against them, but gave way from the ships under pressure. Their man killed man all along the scattered encounter of the leaders, and first among them, the strong son of Menoetios, threw and struck Aurelikos in the thigh, as he turned back, with the sharp point of the spear, and drove the bronze clean through. The spear smashed in the bone and he fell to the ground headlong on his face. Meanwhile warlike Menelo stabbed Thoas in the chest where it was left bare by the shield, and unstrung his limb's strength. Megs, Phileas' son, watched Amphiclos as he came on and was too quick with a stab at the base of the leg, where the muscle of a man grows thickest, so that on the spearhead the sinew was torn apart, and a mist of darkness closed over both eyes. Of the sons of Nestor I, Antilochos, stabbed Atimnios with the sharp spear, and drove the bronze head clean through his flank, so that he fell forward, but Meris with the spear from close up made a lunge at Antilochos in rage for his brother standing in front of the corpse, but before him godlike Thrasymedes was in with a thrust before he could stab, nor missed his quick stroke into the shoulder, and the spearhead shore off the arm's base clear away from the muscles and torn from the bone. Utterly. He fell, thunderously, and darkness closed over both eyes. So these two, beaten down under the hands of two brothers, descended to the dark place, Sarpedon's noble companions and spear-throwing sons of Amisodaros, the one who had nourished the furious Chimera to be an evil to many. Ias, Oilia's son, in an outrush caught Cleobulos alive, where he was fouled in the running confusion, and there unstrung his strength, hewing with the hilt sword at the neck, so all the sword was smoking with blood and over both eyes closed the red death and the strong destiny. Then Penelios and Lycan ran up close together, since these with their spear throws had gone wide of each other, and each had made a cast vainly. So now the two of them ran together with swords. Their Lycan hacked at the horn of the horsehair crested helm, but the sword blade broke at the socket, Penelios cut at the neck underneath the ear, and the sword sank clean inside, with only skin left to hold it, and the head slumped aside, and the limbs were loosened. Mary owns on his light feet overtaking Akama stabbed him in the right shoulder as he climbed up behind his horses and the darkness drifted over his eyes as he crashed from the chariot. Idomenia stabbed Eremus in the mouth with the pitiless bronze, so that the brazen spearhead smashed its way clean through below the brain in an upward stroke, and the white bone splintered, and the teeth were shaken out with the stroke and both eyes filled up with blood, and gaping he blew a spray of blood through the nostrils and through his mouth, and death in a dark mist closed in about him. So these lords of the Danans killed each his own man. 
they as wolves make havoc among lambs or young goats in their fury, catching them out of the flocks, when the sheep separate in the mountains through the thoughtlessness of the shepherd, and the wolves seeing them suddenly snatch them away, and they have no heart for fighting, so the Danans ravaged the Trojans, and these remembered the bitter sound of terror, and forgot their furious valor. But the great Aias was trying forever to make a spear cast at bronze-helmed Hector, but he in his experience of fighting with his broad shoulders huddled under the bull's hide shield kept watching always the whistle of arrows, the crash of spears thrown. He knew well how the strength of the fighting shifted against him, but even so stood his ground to save his steadfast companions. As when a cloud goes deep into the sky from Olympos through the bright upper air when Zeus brings on the hurricane, so rose from beside the ships their outcry, the noise of their terror. In no good order they went back, while his fast-running horses carried Hector away in his armor, he abandoned the people of the Trojans, who were trapped by the deep-dug ditch unwilling, and in the ditch many fast horses who pulled the chariots left, broken short at the joining of the pole, their master's chariots while Patroclos was on them, calling hard and loud to the Danans with evil intention for the Trojans, who, in clamorous terror, choked all the ways where they were cut off, from. Under their feet stirred the dust storm scattered in clouds, their single foot horses were straining to get back to the city away from the ships and the shelters. But Patroclos, where he saw the stirring of most people, steered there, shouting, and men went down under the axles headlong from chariots as the empty cars rattled onward. Straight across the ditch overleapt those swift and immortal horses the gods had given as shining gifts to Peleus, hurtling onward, as Patroclos' rage stirred him against Hector, whom he tried to strike, but his fast horses carried him out of it. As underneath the hurricane all the black earth is burdened on an autumn day, when Zeus sends down the most violent waters in deep rage against mortals after they stir him to anger because in violent assembly they pass decrees that are crooked, and drive righteousness from among them and care nothing for what the gods think, and all the rivers of these men swell current to full spate and in the ravines of their watercourses rip all the hillsides and dash whirling in huge noise down to the blue. See, out of the mountains headlong, so that the works of men are diminished, so huge rose the noise from the horses of Troy in their running. But Patroclos, when he had cut away their first battalions, turned back to pin them against the ships, and would not allow them to climb back into their city though they strained for it, but sweeping through the space between the ships, the high wall, and the river, made havoc and exacted from them the blood price for many. There first of all he struck with the shining spear pronus in the chest where it was left bare by the shield, and unstrung his limbs' strength. He fell, thunderously, and Patroclos in his next outrush at the Rista, Enop's son, who huddled inside his chariot, shrunk back, he had lost all his nerve, and from his hands the reins slipped Patroclos coming close up to him stabbed with a spear thrust at the right side of the jaw and drove it on through the teeth, then hooked and dragged him with the spear over the rail as a fisherman who sits out on the jut of a rock with line and glittering bronze hook drags a fish, who is thus doomed, out of the water. So he hauled him, mouth open to the bright spear, out of the chariot, and shoved him over on his face, and as he fell the life left him. Next he struck Erelaus, as he swept in, with a great stone in the middle of the head, and all the head broke into two pieces inside the heavy helmet, and he in the dust face downward dropped while death breaking the spirit drifted about him. Afterward with Eremus, Amphoteros, Anapaltes, Clepolemos Damastor's son, Echios and Pyrrhus, Iphias and Euipos, and Argia's son Polymelos, all these he fell to the bountiful earth in rapid succession. But Sarpedon, when he saw his free-girt companions going down underneath the hands of Menoetio's son Patroclos, called aloud in entreaty upon the godlike Lycians, Shame, you Lycians, where are you running to? You must be fierce now, for I myself will encounter this man, so I may find out who this is who has so much strength and has done so much evil to the Trojans, since many and brave are those whose knees he has unstrung. He spoke, and sprang to the ground in all his arms from the chariot, and on the other side Patroclos when he saw him leapt down from his chariot. They as two hook-clawed beak-bent vultures above a tall rock face, high screaming, go for each other, so now these two, crying aloud, encountered together and watching them the son of devious devising Kronos was pitiful, and spoke to Hera, his wife, and his sister, ah me, that it is destined that the dearest of men, Sarpedon, must go down under the hands of Menoetio's son Patroclos. The heart in my breast is balanced between two ways as I ponder, whether I should snatch him out of the sorrowful battle and set him down still alive in the rich country of Lycia, or beat him under at the hands of the son of Menoetio's. In turn the lady Hera of the ox eyes answered him, Majesty, son of Kronos, what sort of thing have you spoken? Do you wish to bring back a man who is mortal, one long since doomed by his destiny, from ill-sounding death and release him? 
Do it, then, but not all the rest of us gods shall approve you. And put away in your thoughts this other thing I tell you, if you bring Sarpedon back to his home, still living, think how then some other one of the gods might also wish to carry his own son out of the strong encounter, since around the great city of Priam are fighting many sons of the immortals. You will waken grim resentment among them. No, but if he is dear to you, and your heart mourns for him, then let him be, and let him go down in the strong encounter underneath the hands of Patroclos, the son of Menoetios, but after the soul and the years of his life have left him, then send death to carry him away, and sleep, who is painless, until they come with him to the countryside of broad Lycia where his brothers and countrymen shall give him due burial with tomb and gravestone. Such is the privilege of those who have perished. She spoke, nor did the father of gods and men disobey her, yet he wept tears of blood that fell to the ground, for the sake of his beloved son, whom now Patroclos was presently to kill, by generous Troy and far from the land of his fathers. Now as these two advancing had come close to each other there Patroclos threw first at glorious Thrasymelos who was the strong henchman of Lord Sarpedon, and struck him in the depth of the lower belly, and unstrung his limb strength. Sarpedon with the second throw then missed with the shining spear, but the spear fixed in the right shoulder of Pedasos the horse, who screamed as he blew his life away, and went down in shrill noise into the dust, and the life spirit flitted from him. The other horses shied apart, the yoke creaked, the guide reins were fouled together as the trace horse lay in the dust beside them, but at this spear famed Automedon saw what he must do and wrenching out the long-edged sword from beside his big thigh in a flashing stroke and without faltering cut loose the trace horse and the other horses were straightened out, and pulled in the guide reins, and the two heroes came together in the heart-perishing battle. Once again Sarpedon threw wide with a cast of his shining spear, so that the pointed head overshot the left shoulder of Patroclos, and now Patroclos made the second cast with the brazen spear, and the shaft escaping his hand was not flung vainly but struck where the beating heart is closed in the arch of the muscles. He fell, as when an oak goes down or a white poplar, or like a towering pine tree which in the mountains the carpenters have hewn down with their wetted axes to make a ship timber. So he lay there felled in front of his horses and chariots roaring, and clawed with his hands at the bloody dust, or as a blazing and haughty bull in a huddle of shambling cattle when a lion has come among the herd and destroys him dies bellowing under the hooked claws of the lion, so now before Patroclos the lord of the shield-armoured Lycians died raging, and called aloud to his beloved companion, dear Glaucos, you are a fighter among men. Now the need comes hardest upon you to be a spearman and a bold warrior. Now, if you are brave, let bitter warfare be dear to you. First you must go among all men who are lords of the Lycians everywhere, and stir them up to fight for Sarpedon, and then you yourself also must fight for me with the bronze spear. For I shall be a thing of shame and a reproach said of you afterward, all your days forever, if the Achaeans strip my armour here where I fell by the ships assembled. But hold strongly on and stir up all the rest of our people. He spoke, and as he spoke death's end closed over his nostrils and eyes, and Patroclo's stepping heel braced to chest dragged the spear out of his body, and the midriff came away with it so that he drew out with the spearhead the life of Sarpedon, and the myrmidons close by held in the hard-breathing horses as they tried to bolt away, once free of their master's chariot. But when he heard the voice a hard sorrow came upon Glaucos, and the heart was stirred within him, and he could not defend Sarpedon. He took his arm in his hand and squeezed it, since the wound hurt him where two crows had hit him with an arrow shot as he swept in on the high wall, and fended destruction from his companions. He spoke in prayer to him who strikes from afar, Apollo, hear me, my lord. You are somewhere in the rich Lycian countryside or here in Troy, and wherever you are you can listen to a man in pain, as now this pain has descended upon me. For see, I have this strong wound on me, and my arm on both sides is driven with sharp pains about, my blood is not able to dry and stop running, my shoulder is aching beneath it. I cannot hold my spear up steady, I cannot go forward to fight against the enemy. And the best of men has perished, Sarpedon, son of Zeus, who will not stand by his children. No, but you at least, my lord, make well this strong wound, and put the pains to sleep, give me strength, so that I may call out to my companions, the Lycians, and stir them to fight on, and I myself do battle over the fallen body. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him. At once he made the pain stop, and dried away from the hard wound the dark running of blood, and put strength into his spirit. And Glaucos knew in his heart what was done, and was happy that the great god had listened to his prayer. 
and first of all he roused toward battle all the men who were lords of the Lycians, going everywhere among them, to fight for Sarpedon, afterward he ranged in long strides among the Trojans, by Pulidamas the son of Panthus and brilliant Agenor, and went to Aeneas and to Hector of the brazen helmet and stood near them and addressed them in winged words, Hector, now you have utterly forgotten your armed companions who for your sake, far from their friends and the land of their fathers, are wearing their lives away, and you will do nothing to help them. Sarpedon has fallen, the lord of the shield-armoured Lycians, who defended Lycia in his strength and the right of his justice. Now brazen Ars has struck him down by the spear of Patroclos. Then, friends, stand beside me, let the thought be shame in your spirit that they might strip away his arms, and dishonor his body, these myrmidons, in anger for all the Danans perished, those whom we Lycians have killed with the spear by the swift ships. He spoke, and the Trojans were taken head to heel with a sorrow untakeable, not to be endured, since he was their city's stay, always, though he was an outlander, and many people came with him, but he was the best of them all in battle always. They went straight for the Danans, raging, and Hector led them, in anger for Sarpedon. Meanwhile the Achaeans roused to the savage heart of Patroclos, the son of Menoetios. First he spoke to the Aeantes, who were burning for battle already, Aeantes, now your desire must be to defend yourselves, and be such as you were among men before, or even more valiant. The man is fallen who first scaled the wall of the Achaeans, Sarpedon. If only we could win and dishonor his body and strip the armor from his shoulders, and kill with the pitiless bronze some one of his companions who fight to defend him. He spoke, and they likewise grew furious in their defense, and when they on either side had made massive their battalions, Trojans and Lycians, and Myrmidons and Achaeans, they clashed together in battle over the perished body howling terribly, with a high crash of the men in their armor, while Zeus swept ghastly night far over the strong encounter that over his dear son might be deadly work in the fighting. First the Trojans shouldered back the glancing-eyed Achaeans when a man, and not the worst of the Myrmidons, was struck down, son of high-hearted Agacles, Epagius the Brilliant. He was one who was lord before in strong-founded Budion, but now, since he had happened to kill his high-born cousin, had come suppliant to Peleus and to the Tees the silver-footed, and these sent him to follow Achilles, who broke men in battle, to Ilion of the horses and the battle against the Trojans. As he caught at a dead man glorious Hector hit him with a stone in the head, and all the head broke into two pieces inside the heavy helmet, and he in the dust face downward dropped, while death breaking the spirit drifted about him and the sorrow took hold of Patroclos for his fallen companion. He steered his way through the ranks of the front fighters, like a flying hawk who scatters into flight the doors and the starlings. So straight for the Lycians, O lord of horses, Patroclos, you swept, and for the Trojans, heart angered for your companion. Now he struck Sthenelaus, beloved son of Ithamines, in the neck with a stone, and broke the tendons loose from about it. The champions of Troy gave back then, and glorious Hector. As far as goes the driving cast of a slender javelin which a man throws making trial of his strength, either in a contest or else in battle, under the heartbreaking hostilities, so far the Trojans gave way with the Achaeans pushing them. But Glaucos was first, lord of the shield-armoured Lycians, to turn again, and kill Bathocles the great-hearted, beloved son of Chalcon, who had dwelled in his home in Hellas conspicuous for wealth and success among all the Myrmidons. It was he whom Glauco stabbed in the middle of the chest, turning suddenly back with his spear as he overtook him. He fell, thunderously, and the closing sorrow came over the Achaeans as the great man went down, but the Trojans were gladdened greatly as the great man went down, but the Trojans were gladdened greatly and came and stood in a pack about him, nor did the Achaeans let go of their fighting strength, but steered their fury straight at them. And there Meriones cut down a chief man of the Trojans, Laogonos, bold son of one Tor, who was Idaean, Zeus' priest, and who was honored in his countryside as a god is. Meriones struck him by jaw and ear, and at once the life spirit fled from his limbs, and the hateful darkness closed in about him. But Aeneas threw his bronze spear at Meriones, hoping to hit him as he came forward under his shield's covering, but Meriones with his eyes straight on him avoided the bronze spear. For he bent forward, and behind his back the long spear's half was driven into the ground so that the but end was shaken on the spear. Then and there as the huge took the force from it, so that the vibrant shaft of Aeneas was driven groundward since it had been thrown in a vain cast from his big hand. But Aeneas was angered in his spirit, and called out to him, Mary owns, though you are a dancer my spear might have stopped you now and for all time, if only I could have hit you. 
Then in turn Mary owned the spear famed answered him, Aeneas, strong fighter though you are, it would be hard for you to quench the strength of every man who might come against you and defend himself, since you also are made as a mortal. But if I could throw and hit you with the sharp bronze in the middle, then strong as you are and confident in your hand's work, you might give the glory to me, and your soul to hate of the horses. He spoke, but the fighting son of Menoetios reprimanded him, Mary owns, when you are a brave fighter, why say such things? See, dear friend, the Trojans will not give back from the body for hard words spoken. Sooner the ground will cover them. Warfare's finality lies in the work of hands, that of words in council. It is not for us now to pile up talk, but to fight in battle. He spoke, and led the way, and the other followed, a mortal like a god. As the tumult goes up from men who are cutting timber in the mountain valleys, and the sound is heard from far off, such was the dull crashing that rose from earth of the wide ways, from the bronze shields, the skins and the strong covering ox hides as the swords and leaf-headed spears stabbed against them. No longer could a man, even a knowing one, have made out the godlike Sarpedon, since he was piled from head to ends of feet under a mass of weapons, the blood and the dust, while others about him kept forever swarming over his dead body, as flies through a sheepfold thunder about the pails overspilling milk, in the season of spring when the milk splashes in the buckets. So they swarmed over the dead man, nor did Zeus ever turn the glaring of his eyes from the strong encounter, but kept gazing forever upon them, in spirit reflective, and pondered hard over many ways for the death of Patroclos, whether this was now the time, in this strong encounter, when their over godlike Sarped and glorious Hector should kill him with the bronze, and strip the armor away from his shoulders, or whether to increase the steep work of fighting for more men. In the division of his heart this way seemed best to him, for the strong henchman of Achilles, the son of Peleus, once again to push the Trojans and bronze-helmed Hector back on their city, and tear the life from many. In Hector first of all he put a temper that was without strength. He climbed to his chariot and turned to flight, and called to the other Trojans to run, for he saw the way of Zeus' sacred balance. Nor did the powerful Lycian stand now, but were all scattered to flight, when they had seen their king with a spear in his heart, lying under the pile of dead men, since many others had fallen above him, once Zeus had strained fast the powerful conflict. But the Achaeans took from Sarpedon's shoulders the armor glaring and brazen, and this the warlike son of Menoetios gave to his companions to carry back to the hollow ships. And now Zeus who gathers the cloud spoke a word to Apollo, go if you will, beloved Phoebos, and rescue Sarpedon from under the weapons, wash the dark suffusion of blood from him, then carry him far away and wash him in a running river, anoint him in ambrosia, put ambrosial clothing upon him, then give him into the charge of swift messengers to carry him, of sleep and death, who are twin brothers, and these two shall lay him down presently within the rich countryside of broad Lycia where his brothers and countrymen shall give him due burial with tomb and gravestone. Such is the privilege of those who have perished. He spoke so, and Apollo, not disregarding his father, went down along the mountains of Ida, into the grim fight, and lifting brilliant Sarpedon out from under the weapons carried him far away, and washed him in a running river, and anointed him in ambrosia, put ambrosial clothing upon him, then gave him into the charge of swift messengers to carry him, of sleep and death, who are twin brothers, and these two presently laid him down within the rich countryside of broad Lycia. But Patroclos, with a shout to Automedon and his horses, went after Trojans and Lycians in a huge blind fury. Besotted, had he only kept the command of Peleades he might have got clear away from the evil spirit of black death. But always the mind of Zeus is a stronger thing than a man's mind. He terrifies even the warlike man, he takes away victory lightly, when he himself has driven a man into battle as now he drove on the fury in the heart of Patroclos. Then who was it you slaughtered first, who was the last one, Patroclos, as the gods called you to your death? Adrestos first, and after him Autonus and Echiclos, Pyramos, son of Megas, and Epista, and Melanippos, and after these Elasos, and Mulios, and Pilates. These he killed, while each man of the rest was bent on escaping. There the sons of the Achaeans might have taken gate-towering Ilion under the hand of Patroclos, who raged with the spear far before them, had not Phoebos Apollo taken his stand on the strong-built tower, with thoughts of death for him, but help for the Trojans. Three times Patroclos tried to mount the angle of the towering wall, and three times Phoebos Apollo battered him backward with the immortal hands beating back the bright shield. As Patroclos for the fourth time, like something more than a man, came at him he called aloud, and spoke winged words in the voice of danger, give way, illustrious Patroclos, it is not destined that the city of the proud Trojans shall fall before your spear nor even at the hand of Achilles, who is far better than you are. 
he spoke, and Patroclus gave ground before him a great way, avoiding the anger of him who strikes from afar, Apollo. But Hector inside the Scyian gates held his single foot horses, and wondered whether to drive back into the carnage, and fight there, or call aloud to his people to rally inside the wall. Thus as he was pondering Phoebos Apollo came and stood by him, assuming the likeness of a man, a young and a strong one, Asios, who was uncle to Hector, breaker of horses, since he was brother of Hecab, and the son of Dimas, and had made his home in Phrygia by the stream of Sangarios. In the likeness of this man Zeus son Apollo spoke to him, Hector, why have you stopped fighting? You should not do it. If I were as much stronger than you as now I am weaker. So might you, in this evil way, hold back from the fighting. But come. Hold straight against Patroclus your strong-footed horses. You might be able to kill him. Apollo might give you such glory. He spoke, and went once more, a divinity, into the mortal struggle, while glorious Hector called to wise Kebriones to lash their horses into the fighting. Meanwhile Apollo went down into the battle, and launched a deadly confusion upon the Argives, and gave glory to the Trojans and Hector. Now Hector let the rest of the Danans be, and he would not kill them, but drove his strong-footed horses straight for Patroclos. On the other side Patroclos sprang to the ground from his chariot holding his spear in his left hand. In the other he caught up a stone, jagged and shining, in the hold of his hand, and threw it, leaning into the throw, nor fell short of the man he aimed at nor threw vainly, but hit the charioteer of Hector, Kebriones, a bastard son of glorious Priam, as he held the reins on his horses. The sharp stone hit him in the forehead and smashed both brows in on each other, nor could the bone hold the rock, but his eyes fell out into the dust before him there at his feet, so that he vaulted to earth like a diver from the carefully wrought chariot, and the life left his bones. Now you spoke in bitter mockery over him, rider Patroclos, see now, what a light man this is, how agile an acrobat. If only he were somewhere on the sea, where the fish swarm, he could fill the hunger of many men, by diving for oysters, he could go overboard from a boat even in rough weather the way he somersaults so light to the ground from his chariot now. So, to be sure, in Troy also they have their acrobats. He spoke so, and strode against the hero Kebriones with the spring of a lion, who as he ravages the pastures has been hit in the chest, and his own courage destroys him. So in your fury you pounced, Patroclos, above Kebriones. On the other side Hector sprang to the ground from his chariot, and the two fought it out over Kebriones, like lions who in the high places of a mountain, both in huge courage and both hungry, fight together over a killed deer. So above Kebriones these two, urgent for battle, Patroclos, son of Menoetios, and glorious Hector, were straining with the pitiless bronze to tear at each other, since Hector had caught him by the head, and would not let go of him, and Patroclos had his foot on the other side, while the other Trojans and Danans drove together the strength of their onset. As east wind and south wind fight it out with each other in the valleys of the mountains to shake the deep forest timber, oak tree and ash and the cornel with the delicate bark, these whip their wide-reaching branches against one another in inhuman noise, and the crash goes up from the splintering timber, so Trojans and Achaeans springing against one another cut men down, nor did either side think of disastrous panic, and many sharp spears were driven home about Kebriones and many feathered. Arrows sprung from the bowstrings, many great throwing stones pounded against the shields, as they fought on hard over his body, as he in the turning dust lay mightily in his might, his horsemanship all forgotten. So long as the sun was climbing still to the middle heaven, so long the thrown weapons of both took hold, and men dropped under them, but when the sun had gone to the time for unyoking of cattle, then beyond their very destiny the Achaeans were stronger and dragged the hero Kebriones from under the weapons and the clamour of the Trojans, and stripped the armour from his shoulders. And Patroclus charged with evil intention in on the Trojans. Three times he charged in with the force of the running war god, screaming a terrible cry, and three times he cut down nine men, but as for the fourth time he swept in, like something greater than human, there, Patroclus, the end of your life was shown forth, since Phoebos came against you there in the strong encounter dangerously, nor did Patroclus see him as he moved through the battle, and shrouded in a deep mist came in against him and stood behind him, and struck his back and his broad shoulders with a flat stroke of the hand so that his eyes spun. Phoebos Apollo now struck away from his head the helmet four-horned and hollow-eyed, and under the feet of the horses it rolled clattering, and the plumes above it were defiled by blood and dust. Before this time it had not been permitted to defile in the dust this great helmet crested in horsehair, rather it guarded the head and the gracious brow of a godlike man, Achilles, but now Zeus gave it over to Hector to wear on his head, Hector whose own death was close to him. 
and in his hands were splintered all the huge, great, heavy, iron-shod, far-shadowing spear, and away from his shoulders dropped to the ground the shield with its shield sling and its tassels. The Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, broke the corslet upon him. Disaster caught his wits, and his shining body went nerveless. He stood stupidly, and from close behind his back a Dardanian man hit him between the shoulders with a sharp javelin, Euphorbos, son of Panthus, who surpassed all men of his own age with the throwing spear, and in horsemanship and the speed of his feet. He had already brought down twenty men from their horses since first coming, with his chariot and his learning in warfare. He first hit you with a thrown spear, O rider Patroclos, nor broke you, but ran away again, snatching out the ash spear from your body, and lost himself in the crowd, not enduring to face Patroclos, naked as he was, in close combat. Now Patroclos, broken by the spear and the god's blow, tried to shun death and shrink back into the swarm of his own companions. But Hector, when he saw high-hearted Patroclos trying to get away, saw how he was wounded with the sharp javelin, came close against him across the ranks, and with the spear stabbed him in the depth of the belly and drove the bronze clean through. He fell, thunderously, to the horror of all the Achaean people. As a lion overpowers a weariless boar in wild combat as the two fight in their pride on the high places of a mountain over a little spring of water, both wanting to drink there, and the lion beats him down by force as he fights for his breath, so Hector, Priam's son, with a close spear stroke stripped the life from the fighting son of Menoetios, who had killed so many, and stood above him, and spoke aloud the winged words of triumph, Patroclos, you thought perhaps of devastating our city, of stripping from the Trojan women the day of their liberty and dragging them off in ships to the beloved land of your fathers. Fool! When in front of them the running horses of Hector strained with their swift feet into the fighting, and I with my own spear am conspicuous among the fighting Trojans, I who beat from them the day of necessity. For you, here the vultures shall eat you. Wretch! Achilles, great as he was, could do nothing to help you. When he stayed behind, and you went, he must have said much to you, Patroclos, lord of horses, see that you do not come back to me and the hollow ships, until you have torn in blood the tunic of manslaughtering Hector about his chest. In some such manner he spoke to you, and persuaded the fool's heart in you. And now, dying, you answered him, O rider Patroclos, now is your time for big words, Hector. Yours is the victory given by Cronos' son, Zeus, and Apollo, who have subdued me easily, since they themselves stripped the arms from my shoulders. Even though twenty such as you had come in against me, they would all have been broken beneath my spear, and have perished. No, deadly destiny, with the son of Leto, has killed me, and of men it was you Euphorbos, you are only my third slayer. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. You yourself are not one who shall live long, but now already death and powerful destiny are standing beside you, to go down under the hands of Iaco's great son, Achilles. He spoke, and as he spoke the end of death closed in upon him, and the soul fluttering free of his limbs went down into death's house mourning her destiny, leaving youth and manhood behind her. Now though he was a dead man glorious Hector spoke to him, Patroclos, what is this prophecy of my headlong destruction? Who knows if even Achilles, son of lovely Herdetes, might before this be struck by my spear, and his own life perish? He spoke, and setting his heel upon him wrenched out the bronze spear from the wound, then spurned him away on his back from the spear. Thereafter armed with the spear he went on, aiming a cast at Automedon, the godlike henchman for the swift-footed son of Iacos, with the spear as he was carried away by those swift and immortal horses the gods had given as shining gifts to Peleus.